Uh, I served in the U.S. Army Air Corps in World War II, and I, I stayed on in the Army Air in the U.S. Air Force after that and retired in 1962. Okay, and what was your highest rank? Uh, I was a, a, a bird colonel, and uh, that was my rank from 1959 until I retired in 1965. And in what general locations did you serve? Repeat the question, please. Yes. In what general locations did you serve? Um, I served in the United States and in Europe and in the Far East, in Japan. Okay, and were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted. <clears throat> Where were you living at the time that you enlisted? I was living in a little town called Castle Rock, which is in Colorado, and Castle Rock is south of Denver. Do you recall the date you enlisted? I think it was uh, around the 12th of February of 1942. Okay, and why did you choose to join? Uh, I, I chose to join for several reasons. Um, it's a kind of a complex of reasons. I was a bachelor, I was a high school teacher, I was a band director of the high school. I, I, I got a call from a, a person who su suggested that there were, I enlist for a special program in meteorology that was opening up. And why did you pick the service branch? So why did you pick the U.S. Army? Well, a little bit of the background to that. Uh, d during the preceding years of the, from 1936 to 1940, I worked with a, a group of men as a, an assistant in a, a laboratory that was on top of Mount Evans, which is a 14,000 foot peak studying the effects of uh, radioactive uh, incoming material from space. And the, the group was run by uh, a person from the University of Chicago named uh, Dr. Froman and a man from the University uh, from uh, from California named Carl Milliken and a man from the University of Denver named Joyce Stearns. And we were on top of Pikes Peak looking at radioactive incoming material. And uh, I was a, 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 just a helper there. But it was through that relationship that I was called about a, a program to create a large number of weathermen or meteorologists to, to support the operations of the Army Air Corps. <clears throat> and uh, so I, I was asked to join a, a group at the University of California at Los Angeles. And uh, there were 80 of us that went there to study meteorology for uh, about 11 months in an intensive program. And can you tell me about your boot camp um, experience or training? The boot camp? Uh, the boot camp was a rather sophisticated boot camp. We were students, graduate students, at on the campus of University of California, uh, 
of, of California at, uh, let's see, what was the name of the town? I forgot it right at the moment. And um, we uh, were in uniform and we attended uh, lectures and laboratory classes during the week. And on Saturdays, we went to um, a military place where we did our military training, marches and so on. And uh, Do you remember your first impressions when you arrived there for boot camp? I, I arrived there by train from Denver to Los Angeles. Um, and uh, it's it's a probably a, a twenty four hour train trip at that time, and uh, I then found my way from the train station in Los Angeles out to the campus of the school, which is in uh, what is the name of the town now, and then I. I found a place to live there, and that's it. And then I, I joined the group there. Okay, and do you remember the food you guys received? What type of food you ate during boot camp? Um, I think I I ate in the the dormitory uh, restaurants at the university, and. Uh, I, I lived with an elderly couple in their house, and I don't think I had any meals there. So I, I did all my eating uh, uh, outside, and we did not eat as a group, we ate as individuals. We lived pretty much like students, uh, so we had a rather typical student life. Do you remember your instructors? Uh, Yes, I do. Um, uh, I'm, I'm having a little bit tr trouble recalling things right now. Uh, uh, let's see. Um, I'm having a, a blank right now. Okay, we can go on to the next question. So after boot camp, where did you go? Uh, <clears throat> I got <clears throat> I got my commission as a second lieutenant, <clears throat> and my first assignment was to uh, a bomber air base that was at Pueblo, Colorado, and uh, I was there for probably three weeks. And then at Christmas time in '42, I was reassigned to uh, Washington D.C. Uh, to a group in the Pentagon, and I arrived there shortly after Christmas uh, in early '43. And can you talk about what you did at the bomber air base in Colorado? Uh, it was a, 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 two wings of fighter of bombers uh, that were being prepared to to go overseas, and uh, uh, they were doing training missions in Colorado. They would, uh, and so the forecast was for takeoff and landing weather and in route weather to the target. It was short-range forecasting uh, that covered a period of about 36 to 48 hours. Could you talk more about the training missions? The training missions? Uh, the, the training missions were done with a very elite staff of, of professional people. Uh, many of them were from Europe. Um, one was from Germany, uh, three or four of them were from Norway, 
Uh, one was from the United States, and uh, I think the staff consisted of about eight or nine people. Okay, and when you went to um, Washington, D.C., what was your assignment there? Uh, I was assigned to uh, uh, the uh, Army Weather Center. I think it was called, uh, uh, and it was a, a forecast center for the entire military, and it was on the fifth floor, and uh, I was assigned to uh, one of four different long-range forecast units. Uh, it, I was LRFA, that's the A group of long-range forecasting. And there was a B, C, and D, and each group had a different technology for making long-range forecasts. And the purpose of the four units was to run a test program over current real-time weather forecasts made for 10 days in advance, twice a week. And the forecasts of the four different groups were evaluated as to their accuracy. The purpose was to find out which method would be the most usable for the invasion forecast of Normandy to take place uh, in 1944. And this program started in 1943 and was tested for about a year before it was put into application. And can you please describe a typical day for you on the service? Well, they varied as to where I was. Um, a typical day would be probably during that period of time I was in England. And uh, I was at that time a, a captain. And uh, because the weather preparation had to be done and ready for decision making, early in the morning, uh, our activity started earlier, around 10 o'clock in the after evening, the night before. And so from late in the evening, uh, the map, weather map preparation took place and the products were ready and completed by seven o'clock in the morning. And the uh, briefers then presented the, the results to the military staff, uh, and the operations were probably for the next day, and uh, so, so that was the operations. Uh, I I was in a section called the upper air section, and uh, there were four long range forecast units, and mine was LRFA. And uh, there was LRFB, LRFC, and LRFD, four different technologies, each independently making uh, six to ten day forecasts. Uh, and these were operational forecasts. And they would be scrambled together in the morning for the best forecast that would become the official forecast. And um, you were a captain, so what were, your, what were your duties as captain? Uh, uh, I was responsible for the uh, technical processes that were used in making upper air map forecasts. Uh, I was responsible for getting the meteorological data in that could be used there, which was a, ch a main challenge during wartime because weather observations were classified and we had the, the problem of breaking codes. We didn't do the code breaking, but we were the, we, we assisted in the process of code breaking. And uh, then to, um, 
the main project was drawing the weather maps. And then, of course, the top thing was to apply the technology to making uh, prognostic maps that were made. And our prognostic maps were made out to three days in advance, and then one that was made six days in advance. These were actual weather maps. And the weather maps that we made in the upper air, air section were at two levels. Uh, one was at 10,000 foot level, and the other was around 20,000 foot level. We didn't do them at levels. We did them at constant pressure. Uh, but we, they were approximately at those two positions. Okay. Um, did you see combat during your service? Um, I did see combat after the Norman invasion. Uh, I, I was in an advanced weather group that followed uh, the, the Norman in invasion and set up uh, a, a briefing with the with the advance command, that, that and uh, a, a few days after Normandy, my small group went into a place adjacent to the landing beach called uh, Camille sur la Mer, and uh, we set up our operation in a, a French farmhouse that had been abandoned. And we lived in abandoned uh, dormitories of the Germans that had just left there. And we were there for about uh, three weeks. And then we followed the uh, invasion forces as they proceeded eastward to uh, Paris. And I think we got into Paris on the uh, 19th or the 29th of July. And then we stayed outside in the suburb of Paris for the rest of that winter in a facility where we continued our, our forecasting. And uh, we ended that on VE Day, which was in May of 45. Were there any casualties in your unit? No. No, no casualties. Okay, and were you a prisoner of war? No. Were you awarded any medals or citations? Um, yes. Um, I think I, I, I got the Bronze Star and uh, Something else, I forgot what it was right now. Okay, and um, how did you get the bronze star? Uh, it was for the uh, forecast invasion of Normandy. Okay, and um, how did you stay in touch with your family? Uh, we had the emails, and uh, that was the only way that we stayed in touch. Uh, I think emails were written probably twice a week, and uh, I think you, you know the system. Uh, that was the only way. There was a lag in emails. And, and, and there was a brevity involved in the amount of material you could send. Could you elaborate more on that? What's that? Could you elaborate more on that? Uh, it was a universal system. Everybody used it. Uh, and uh, there was a form, email form, and... Uh, and there were many rules as to what you could say or not say. And every email that was written by every person was reviewed by a special group of people to see that the content was okay. And it was then electronically sent.
from England to the United States, <clears throat> and then printed out in a f email format, which was about four to six inches in paper. And then that was mailed t to the family, from, I think probably from Washington. Um, during your time in the service, did you feel pressure or stress at all? I, I did as the, uh, the event of D-Day approached. Uh, there were a very limited number of persons, even in the unit that I worked for, that had the uh, privilege of knowing the uh, in advance the date of D-Day. And... Uh, I got from information of the day to D day. I think it was in the seven, around the seventeenth of May, which was about oh, three weeks ahead of the actual invasion date. And I think in in the group that I work with, there were probably only two or three of us that were given the date. And we had to continue to work in a, a normal mode without trying to reveal any special effort that was uh, pin, pinpointed, pinpointed toward that particular invasion date. Uh, and it worked well. And uh, as far as I know, there were no violations of the information. Was there something special you did for good luck? What's that? Was there something special you did for good luck? Didn't Not get it. Good luck charm. Could you say that again? Yeah. Was there something special you did for good luck? Did for good luck? Mm -hmm. I, there probably were lots of things that, that were based because um, it, the forecasting method was based on likelihoods of things happening and there's a small difference between likelihood and good luck so i think good luck was involved almost all the time okay uh how did people entertain themselves oh okay. uh the group that i i was with uh would go on sundays down to london and it, it was a group that was interested in classical music. And we used to go to the the concerts there. And uh, the, we also liked ba ballet. And uh, what is the name of the famous ballet group from London? It had been, where they performed in downtown London, it had been bombed out. So they moved out to a, a suburb of London and performed there. And we went there every Wednesday night to their performance there. And that was a lot of fun. That's where the tennis is now being played. At. So music, music was one of our hobbies. So, and uh, not all of the people that, that I worked with were involved, but some of them did. We also had a, an officer's club, which was a very popular place, and so we spent time there. What did you do there? What type of activities did you guys do? No, I, 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 I can't remember. We did have presentations there. The uh, what, what was the name of the, the band? director from Colorado, the famous, he was killed in World War II. He and his orchestra performed there at one time. Can't remember his name now. Sorry about that. No, it's fine. Uh, did you see any USO shows? Uh, yes. Uh, the the USO, USO shows were perfor, for, 
performed there at, at Bushy Park, and I went to them, and uh, they were good, and uh, they were fun to go to. What kind of shows were they? Well, the big band shows. Uh, well, why is it? I can't think of the name of it. Who is the big band man? Allie? Len Miller. What? Len Miller. Oh, Glenn Miller, yes. It, it, that, that, that came a little bit toward the end of my stay there at Bushy Park. So we got to see Glenn Miller. And uh, I am. Um, that, that's about it. Um, I, I had a group, uh, I had about 12 officers in my group that I was responsible for, but we had a large group of uh, enlisted people. I, I must have had about 30 people that were involved in processing the meteorological data. Many of them were wax, and there was a great group. And there was quite a bit of responsibility for looking after the well-being of the, that group. And you were asking one of the things we did. I just remembered we had a, a game going on all the time in my working unit. <clears throat> uh, it was called... Uh, uh, Krieg. And it's a chess game, and it involves uh, three pr people, and it's a spectator, spectator game. It goes fairly fast; it takes maybe forty-five minutes for a game. So when I had a, we had a, a blitzkrieg game going <clears throat> all day long, all night, and people could come and go and play in it, adjacent to where we did our work. Uh, the word blitzkrieg refers to a, a way of playing chess. Would you like me to tell you briefly about it? Yeah, All right. Sure. Uh, there are two chess players, but uh, they sit back to back, and uh, each one has his own board, and in between them there's a third board, so there are three boards. The one in the center has both sets of players, and each player has a board with only his own players. <clears throat> then in addition to the two players, there is a third person who is a refer referee. He stands, he can watch all three boards, and he monitors the center board. So whenever a player makes a move, uh, he, he, he also makes that move on the center board. And it goes fairly fast. I think it's probably 30 seconds for each move. And so the, the opponents... In the beginning, you have no idea about the layout of the opponent. So he, uh, by inference, he'll move a piece. And the referee can simply tell him whether it's a permissible move or not a permissible move. Uh, but by memory and inference, he begins to get a feeling for what his opponent is doing over here, the layout. And so... It's, it's called Kriegspiel, it's like a German word for warfare, and uh, it, the main event, is it's great for spectators, they can stand around, and they can see everything that the referee says, can see, and they can really get a guess who's going to win. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very exciting game to watch, and uh, in my group, I had a... a, a an airman who was a member of the 12th of the United States chess team, and it happened to be located in London at that time. <clears throat> and he worked in my unit. He was a very famous chess player. So he's the one that introdu introduced the game of Krigspiel. So we had Krigspiel going 24 hours a day, uh, and all these people watching around. And... Uh, so that was one one way we had recreation. Uh, I was not particularly good at that game, but I had players that were terrific. Can you visualize the game roughly? Yeah. 
Yeah. It doesn't take too long to play. It probably goes between a half hour and 45 minutes. Then a new game starts. And everybody wanted to get into the game. And the people s sitting around would actually bet on the winner. Huh. And they, the, uh, what do you call it, the betting odds would change as the game progressed. <clears throat> Craigspiel, that was really <clears throat> the main recreation we had. And uh, I, we, we had a <clears throat> one member of my group who was a uh, member of the United States chess team. Forgot about that. <clears throat> Not everybody performed because uh, it took skill to do it. I, I was not particularly good at it, but I tried. That's all that matters, <laughs> to try. Okay, um, did you go on leave? On leave? <clears throat> no, I don't think so. Uh, <clears throat> I think some of my went after I went to to the mainland. <clears throat> Some of the, my subordinates went on leave back to England because they had formed friendships in England. I think we were in England 16 months. So they went back to visit their friends in England. I, I never did that, but uh, that was possible for, during the war. Okay. Do you recall any humorous or unusual events? What's that? Do you recall any humorous or unusual events? I didn't get quite get that. Yeah. Did you recall any like funny or unusual events? Uh, yeah. Unusual events. Yeah. Bob. <clears throat> we have several. Mm -hmm. uh, well, before the invasion, uh, on Sundays, the uh, General staff meetings were canceled, but a small group of uh, officers would go to General Eisenhower's headquarters and give him a, a Sunday morning briefing. And uh, it would usually involve someone from G2 and G3, that would be uh, operations and information, and then weather, so that those three groups would usually brief him. Well, there was one, maybe two Sundays, where the person who ordinarily went to br brief wasn't able to go, so I went with the briefing team to the general's quarters. So uh, I had a couple of opportunities to uh, have the kind of a personal contact with General Eisenhower with uh, two or three other people in his living room on Sunday mornings. And they were nice experiences. Okay. Uh, did you or the others pull pranks? What's that? Did you or the others pull pranks on each other? Pranks? Like Don't, tricks? Yes, lots of tricks. One, one of the, I think, one of the funniest and most outrageous tricks that ever happened is uh, after we set up operations, in uh, Bushy Park, and we were doing weather maps. Uh, we are we were looking around always for for good weather forecasters, and there was a name came up of a young forecaster. So he came to uh, forecast for us, and he was in the surface section, drawing the surface maps, the type of maps you see on television. And uh, I had a friend, kind of a, a wizened man, very smart, but kind of, he played games. Well, he, what he had done it hasn't happened very often, but we had another group of WAFs and airmen who plot the weather maps. Uh, they put the weather observations on the map, and then that map is given to a, a meteorologist, and he, he draws the map. Well, he arranged to have this particular map pl plotted with yesterday's data. So he put this on the table and asked this newcomer, I won't mention his name, 
would he please draw the map? So he drew the map. And after he had drawn it, he was complimented on how well he had drawn the map. So my friend said, wouldn't you like to give this briefing to the senior staff? And so at this point, everything becomes quite serious. And so he begins to uh, brief the weather situation, this time to the colonels. And then a few leading questions were asked, well, what's the weather going to be at base 26? And he would give a forecast. Well, at the end of all of this, my friend that had provided the plotted map said, this is yesterday's map. <laughs> it devastated him and everybody got a huge laugh out of it. That was a pretty cruel joke, I thought. <laughs> Yeah. Can I speak? What's that? Can I speak? Oh. Okay. Okay. Um, as I mentioned earlier, a little bit ago, uh, our work effort on a daily basis usually started around 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock in the evening to get ready for the preparation and presentation that took place around 8 o'clock in the morning, the following morning. And so one evening, uh, I was there, and it was a little after midnight, in the, my upper air section, and I noticed that the uh, person that to be at the surface section hadn't showed up yet. I knew who it was, and I began to get anxious about his not being there. It looked like a kind of a crisis situation. It never happened before. So I had a little extra time in my schedule. So I got in my Jeep and I, I went to where he lived, which was uh, maybe 45 minutes away. And uh, as I got toward that area, I could see that it had been bombed that night because there, there was debris and damage. So I became very anxious since he hadn't shown up. And sure enough, when I got to his billet, I seen that it had been hit indirectly and it was all dark, so I r raced up the stairway to his apartment, which was on the second floor, and I opened the door, and I noticed that the blackout curtains that or drapes that hang from the ceiling to the floor had all been blown away from the wall, and the glass had been blown away, and the bl blackout curtain was lying on his bed, and he was in the bed, so I was very anxious. Well, I went over to him, and I shook him, discovered miracle he was, he was still asleep and uh, when he finally looked up he said he he was he in America, he was from North Dakota and he was Norwegian and he said uh, Norwegian descent he said and he he said Judas priest what has happened here <laughs> so he was okay so I got him up, and we got in the Jeep, and we got back down to work about 3 o'clock. And so he got to his desk, and everything went okay. But he was famous for his, he was a very fine forecaster, and nothing bothered him. That was, his name was Olaf Nius, N-J-U-S, very fine. He was a captain. That's a, that's a one story. Now, see, what was the other one? Oh, as we got toward the time of uh, VE Day, that's the day of, uh, you know, uh, of, of invasion, it became evident that something new was happening. This was around Thursday evening, and the forecast was originally for Monday morning. And... Uh, became evident that the forecast was not going to hold and we might have to postpone the invasion from Monday to Tuesday morning. So uh, I, we could say it was all due to a, a new development that was beginning to look in the upper air where I was in the vicinity south of Iceland. Then nothing had shown up elsewhere in the surface observation. So I had a friend I knew 
who was stationed in Iceland. And he was a pilot, and I had been in touch with him before. So on my own, I telephoned him and asked if, if he would make a spiral ascent with his aircraft, which he had done a couple of times, up to about 18,000 feet, and make meteorological observations. So he did that, and it was his observations that first confirmed to everybody that we were getting a new cyclonic development aloft that developed downward and produ produced the surface low pressure system that came into the invasion area on Monday morning. And that was the beginning of the for change forecast. The real drama was the, the change of the forecast. But it, I think that phone call and his flight had a lot to do with the beginning of the change in the forecast because there were three groups involved. There was the Admiralty, the Air Ministry, and the Air Force. It, each three of them had, and it, when you have three groups working together, it's cumbersome, isn't it? And there's a lot of, a lot of ego involved too. Each, each thought he had the answer to everything. So it was a cumbersome system where senior officers were um, debating with one another. But the uh, Saturday night, the decision was made out of the three units, two of them agreed that it should be delayed what, 24 hours. And what that meant is that the uh, invasion forces, which are very cumbersome, that were already, some of them already in move, said they had to stop and sit tight for 24 hours and then continue the move. And that was quite a, quite, it was quite a difficult decision to make. It wasn't theirs to make, but to recommend. Anyway, uh, the Admiralty agreed to the change. The Air Force, my group, the group I was with, agreed to the change. The uh, Air Ministry did not, so it was a two to one, even so the final choice was still iffy. So uh, everything was on edge to see how it worked out. And of course, as you know, it worked out fine on Tuesday. And the I think the uh, delay tactic enhanced the success of the ultimate invasion. I, it's a little bit complicated to explain why that was true, but it was true. That it was like a masterminded uh, invasion, and but it happened by chance to be the way it worked out. And uh, so, th so that's kind of a good feeling and kind of a bad feeling. Did I say it well? Yes. Uh, anyway, that was probably the highlight. It was that delay, the delay of the forecast and how it happened. But, uh, that was it. I apologize. Uh, that I have difficulty remembering these things. It's totally fine. Uh, where were you on VE Day? VE Day? Oh, I know that. I was living outside of Paris, uh, about, what's the name? I can't remember the name of the place right now. And, uh, We had an officers club there that was in a, a, a very famous building called the, the Henry the Fourth Pavilion and I spent, we spent quite a bit of time there and I was there that evening uh, outside of Paris and that's where I, we, we, we had set up our weather office in a, a girls school, a very nice girls school and uh, had very nice facilities there. 
I had a, my, the house where I lived was a very nice house. And uh, so the, on the, the next day, I, on VE day, I went to, to Paris. I caught a train and went into Paris. It was a, about a 45 minute train ride. What did you think about the officers and your fellow servicemen? What did I think about the officers? Yeah. And what was the rest of your... And your fellow servicemen? And my fellow servicemen. Oh. Uh, I have lasting memories of them. I think wonderful people. And I stayed in touch with them. Uh, I was very lucky to be in association with them. Some some were great people, some were not so great people, but I, I stayed in touch with all of them. And uh, I think I told you my roommate, the man that I stayed with for 16 months and slept in the, uh, the what do you call it, the, the shelters during uh, was Morrison H. Beach, or Maury Beach. He and I were buddies. Uh, he later became chairman and president of Travelers Insurance Company here in, in uh, Connecticut. And his wife was a violinist. Her name was Yvonne. And she became uh, centrally involved in managing and operating the Hartford Symphony Orchestra. So he was my great friend, great person, wonderful guy, very gentle. Not not a, a warlike person at all. Okay, um, can you talk about re-enlisting after the war? Talk about what? Re-enlisting after the war? Yes. Um, I, I did several things. Uh, um, I worked on several projects. Um, uh, they were all interesting. Uh, one project was a classified project that was with, uh, and uh, I, I ended up being assigned to, to the Air War College as a as a, a, a professor there, and I was in charge of weapon systems, science, and technology. That was my field, weapon systems, science, and technology. And I would give the opening lecture each year to the War College students, and that would be on around the 23rd of August. The class lasted for one year. Uh, the class consisted of I'm not quite sure, two or three hundred students, I think, maybe. And these were senior officers, um, usually bird colonels, a, a few one-star officers. So it was a very pr prestigious group. And I gave the opening lecture each year uh, to that group. And then I uh, sponsored speakers that would come and speak. Uh, I sponsored several w well-known speakers and had good times with them. One was the senator from Arizona, what was his name? I can't remember his name. That was a good time. It was a, a, a challenging time. I know I dreaded doing that opening lecture, and it was a two-hour lecture would be in two parts, 45 minutes, a break, and then 45 minutes, and then a question period. And this was a, uh, a group of very challenging people. And I was there two, I think going on three years, then I decided to um, 
retire early and I, I joined an aerospace company called Cayman Aerospace, Command Aerospace. Uh, it, it was located in Bloomfield, Connecticut. And uh, it's a great company, wonderful company. I was the chief scientist there and I was there for 12 years, I guess. And then I I quit or quit or retired. It was a good time. I I liked it very much. I liked Charlie Command, the uh, owner. He was a great person, really a great person. He had two sons that were guitarists, and the sons made a a, a, a guitar. What was it called? The company makes it, and it still sells the guitar. Look at it. That's about it. Okay. Um, what were your duties at the aerospace company? At the, at the aerospace company? Oh, the main duty, I had se several, but one of the main ones was to uh, instrument... Uh, heavy aircraft with special airborne monitoring systems and computers that could be used to go out and make weather observations. It's called an airborne weather reconnaissance system. It was AWARS. And uh, so it was an interactive uh, instrumentation between the atmosphere and the flying of the atmosphere. I, I think one one of the interesting things I did was for R-71s. I don't really know the 71. It's the aircraft that flies higher, higher than the speed of sound. They, we wanted to fly three of them from the East Coast to the West Coast in such a way that they would never create a sonic boom that would reach the ground. And uh, that would be, <clears throat> you could do that by changing the airspeed or the flight level or the orientation of the aircraft as they enter different types of atmospheres. And it had to be done in real time. The aircraft is a supersonic aircraft. It flies at Mach 2.5. So we did write a system, and we did fly three aircraft across that didn't produce a sonic boom that reached the ground. Didn't sound exciting, but it was. Uh, so you did it by different altitudes, different airspeeds, different orientations, and that was d done in flight with real-time data. So it, everything had to be done very fa fast. So it was all computerized. And we decided the best place to do that was at United Airlines Center, which is outside of Chicago. And I knew the people there, and I asked them if they would do it, and they said yes. So we wrote the program, loaded it on their computer, went out there and sat with them, ran the program, it went just fine. Okay, um, can you tell me about being discharged? What's that? Can you tell me about being discharged? What? When your service ended, do you remember that day? Or any well, I didn't get the word. Yeah, about being discharged? Still didn't get it. Say it again. Yeah, discharged? Discharge. Mm -hmm. Oh, it was okay. Uh, it came a little bit sudden. Uh, uh, there was a ceremony. The uh, the faculty at the Air War College all stood it in uniform outside the campus, and the 
commanding general of the Air University, presented me with my retirement. That it was tradition. It was a great ceremony. It was a Saturday, all dressed up, flushed up, with a, a small little, little band. Okay, and what was your homecoming like? Homecoming? It was fine. Busy because I had to find a new place to live and uh, had to start a new job uh, with new thinking that I hadn't done. And technology was going like mad. <laughs> and I didn't think I'd ever catch up. I think I was frightened to death. I think it was harder, hardest time in my life. I was about 46, I guess, at the time. Maybe 50, I'm not sure. And uh, I'm not sure whether I really made the leap. I think the leap is getting harder as time goes by. I don't envy young people anymore looking for a second job. <clears throat> it must be absolutely devastating. Uh, how did the military influence your thinking about war, or just in general? So, how did the what? How did the military influence your thinking about war, or just in general? Yes, I, I thought a lot about it, and it, yes, it had a lot of influence on me. Uh, it, it, and uh, and the, it, it had very complicated uh, I, I was I, I was never a dissident. I was always a, lo a loyal supporter, particularly since I had been at the war college, you know. Uh, but uh, m mostly, I ended up with an enormous respect for uh, our military system. Uh, I think we have a great wonderful, dedicated system. Uh, I had a, a son that was in the Vietnam War. He was a Marine. He, d he didn't have a very good experience. That was a feedback into my life. I thought a lot about it. It changed his life. and uh, So it's a very complicated question. And I, I guess, to be honest with you, i would never gotten all the parts put back together. Uh, but I, I, I think I'm a, a party loyalist, good or bad or indifferent. I, uh, I go to reunions and uh, I believe in I believe in people. I have faith in people. I'm not a critic of anything. I salute. <laughs> Did you join any veteran organizations? Organizations? Veteran organizations? Yes. Uh, I've joined two. Uh, one is a, 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 a religious group. I can't think of the name of it. They, uh, Ali, can you help me with it? They have a, I've taken Ali, they have a retreat center out in Colorado in the mountains. And, and it's an officer, officers, oh, officers, Christian Officers Association. Christian Officers Association. It's a good group. I've been a member of that group, and uh, not always quite happy with some of the things they do, but it's a good group. I am also a, a member of a, a, a weather group, a retired weather group. That's probably my main group. And uh, they meet every two years, and uh, they have a meeting coming up this coming summer. 
it's a blind group. And uh, then I also meet with some of the people that were in London during World War II. Uh, so there are three groups that I belong to. And I think the one that I'm most attached to is the weather group. And I used to be closely attached to the Christians, the, the, the religious group. It was a good group. Uh, I think Allie, I took Allie to one of the outings, and uh, there, there are misgivings about the group, but it, it, it was okay. So I had three groups, and I'm still faithful to them. The Christian Officers Association, the Weather Officers Association, and the Eighth Air Force Association. Okay. Um, how did your service and experiences affect your life? Well, they were my life. And uh, I think it, they affected it for the better. I don't think I started out at all in that direction. And I was almost a grown up by the time the war started. I was 22. And so most of my military system came as a man, not as a young man. Uh, <clears throat> I never thought about the military at all, last thing in the world. Uh, it came just like that, you know. Pearl Harbor and bingo, I was in uniform. <laughs> I enlisted, but uh, I guess to be honest, I have to say, I enlisted because somebody else suggested it would be a good idea to do. To, to, uh, I told you about that, the job opportunity, and uh, I was happy with where I was. But where I was, I was in a, a county of Colorado where most of the young men were sons of, of uh, ranchers, and uh, they were 4D type on their, on their classification because they were needed by their dads to run the ranch. So uh, I, I was a teacher, unmarried, so I was prime candidate for being drafted. <laughs> so I enlisted. <laughs> uh, that's true, but not exactly. I, li I enlisted because I got a telephone call from these people I told you about, about this program in, in meteorology. And they were looking for people to fill a a t an assignment at UCLA, so that was a, kind of a combination of things. <laughs> Is there anything you would like to add that has not been added in the interview? Oh, well, I, I'm very, very proud of, uh, I, I think what you're doing is great, and uh, I would like to do everything I can to enhance it, make it work and be good. Uh, uh, let's see. Add. I can't think of anything that I should say. There are groups that you could... Uh, I, have a, I have a list of, of officers from Connecticut that were meteorologists. It would be interesting to see in World War Two, see how many of them are still around. You might want that list. I'll I'll dig it out. It's a, maybe obsolete a little bit. <clears throat> I'll I could do that if you want to. I I try to stay in touch with them by emails. It's kind of fun to be in touch. Some of them have gone on to do great things. I'd like to thank you for your service oh. and also for taking the time to be interviewed today. Well, I thank you kindly. I uh, wish I were had been more up to your expectations, but no, 
there it is. That's the way it comes out. And uh, and I'm glad it's I did it. And uh, also I'm glad it's over. <laughs> <laughs>